I want you to go over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And Father, we thank you for your presence today. What an easy thing it was for us today to pray and to enter into your presence. Thank you, Father, that, that you visit us. You sit in the praises of your people. And so, Lord, beyond the experience of having a touch from you, we want to hear from you because it's the entrance of the word that illuminates. It brings light and gives understanding to the simple. And so we avail ourselves right now to the incorruptible seed of the word of God to be planted in our hearts. And we declare ourselves good ground for that seed to be planted. And it will produce 30, 60, and 100-fold return in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that? You believe your good ground? You believe that just hearing the word of God will promote health in your body and strength to your bones? Do you believe that? That's the truth. It's what the word says. Amen. Mark chapter 6, look at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. That's the title of this series. This is part three, Moved with Compassion. Has anybody noticed their compassion level going up? That's God. That's the heart of God. This, this word, move with compassion, we'll look at it in just a second in the Greek. It's used only 12 times in the entire Bible. All of them are pointing to Jesus, talking about Jesus, or it's Jesus himself using the word in a parable. All of it surrounds Jesus. So when we talk about moved with compassion, that yearning that's in our hearts, that's the heart of Jesus manifesting. So we're not just doing things because that's what I saw somebody else do. When we go to church, we do this, we do this. No, there's a, there's a compelling that happens on the inside. It literally means to have the bowels yearn. So this is deep inside you. You begin to feel for the person that you're having compassion on. Amen? Praise God. Now go over to, um, I want you to go over to Mark. I'm going to skip a bunch of things. We looked at the word mercy. In fact, Harrison, pull up Romans 9, 15. While you guys are turning to Mark, I'll, I'll quote this for you. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So you see these words used together. They are not the same. Sometimes people use them interchangeably, but compassion is the feeling that we get, and mercy is actually a verb to compassionate. This is the action of compassion. So compassion feels the need, but mercy fills the need. It's the action. We, we sense something, we have a heart for it, and we start to act because we're compelled to do so, rather than it just being religious obligation. Do you have a comment? Okay, you're texting. Okay. <laughs> okay, are you making... Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just completely called him out, right? Okay, I should have just looked the other way, right? <laughs> sorry. Put your phone away. No. Okay, sorry, sorry. One thing that really helps us, pull up the next one, Harrison, is to remember the mercy that was given towards you. You know, if you ever find yourself looking down on somebody because, you know, people don't always act like they should. Is that true? Okay. Instead of getting offended or, or looking at being their victim, being moved with compassion will actually elevate you out of the ring of having those exchanges. People may say ugly things to you, but being moved with compassion will move you out of their target for those kinds of things. Remembering what you were forgiven of is how you can tap this. That's the heart of God. You just start thinking about, but for the grace of God, there go I. Galatians, is it 6.1? Uh, says, you who are spiritual, when you see somebody overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But for the grace of God, there go we, right? Each of us. This is one way we can tap into it. I've been forgiven of so much. Last week, we looked at the woman with the alabaster flask. She was forgiven much. So she loved much. Amen? I do. That made me laugh. <laughs> no, it was funny. Um, Real time. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, it's true that they're two different words, that you, you were talking about mercy and compassion, because God used them both in the same sentence. Right. So let's pretend they're the same words. I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. Well, that sounds bananas. <laughs> so he used two separate words on purpose, right? Um, but the other thing, and this just hit me, is have you ever said of someone, wow, they're so merciful? Anybody ever, like, seen that? Well, how would we know that? We would have had to have seen it because mercy is an action. You can't say someone is merciful if there's nothing to prove it, right? Um, so mercy is an action. And I'll be honest with you, until we started talking about this, I've never thought of it in that context, that, that mercy is an action. But it is. Um, what you do is merciful. It's full of mercy. Amen? Um, but the other thing is compassion is God's perspective. You know, when we have compassion on someone, I would say it's not just that he's sharing our heart with us, that we're actually sitting and seeing things from his view, right? It's the view of truth. The view of truth should produce compassion. And here's the wonderful thing it also does is it removes the pain that is and the hurt that is aimed at you because you see God's perspective. And you can act appropriately, be merciful appropriately from his perspective. This is a power position. Really, like, if we can uh, walk in this, man, talk about being Christ-like, right? Feeling what he feels, doing what he does, but this, the way this is framed, it sounds like fruit. It doesn't sound like something I have to put on and yearn for, try for. This is something that he produces in me, and merely by having my perspective changed, I will act differently. You know, I, we used, we've prayed this before, where... We we had uh, with teens. I remember there was this one girl who started um, dating this boy, which automatically the dad in me is like, no, <laughs> you know. Um, but we pray, and we just saw the situation. It was just bad. It's like, oh, bless your little heart. And but we prayed this prayer: Lord, open her eyes that she would see the truth. See the the lowest level of influence is to try to manipulate her to see what we see. But what you really want is, Lord, show her the truth. Because I believe when people see the truth, their heart knows how to choose it. Right? And by the way, the prayer worked. Very shortly thereafter, they were together no more. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Um, but I, that's what we're talking about here, is seeing things from his view. When we sit in the seat of compassion, we, we are in his perspective. Amen. This, this is what we tell all teenage girls. All guys are scumbags. If you live by that, you'll do well. So, it's, it's, okay? Not this one. That's the deception. That's the deception right there. You, ha you have the exception is what they think. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, praise God. You know, what he was just saying about you know, being moved with compassion, the, the position of power in Jesus. While he was sharing, I, I was thinking of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. I mean, that's not what would enter my mind, I don't think. You know what I mean? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In my mind, they know exactly what they're doing. Their intent is to kill me and slowly, torturously, right? They know exactly what they're doing. But the compassion in him brought him to a place that he could say that and it be truth. So what have I got to worry about? What's the worst thing that somebody's ever done to me? Nothing close to that. And there's a place in Jesus' heart that we can say, forgive them. I forgive them. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Lord. Wow, that was by the Lord. Hmm. Mark chapter 10. Now, let me, let me say this before we get there. I was going to read out of Matthew. I was going to read both accounts, Matthew 20. And this is an account 
that it's the same event, the same thing that happened. In Matthew's account, Matthew was an eyewitness, okay? He mentions two people, and they bring out some of the same details, and then some of them are a little different, like Mark expands on a couple of things. So let's start reading in verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. See, in Matthew's account, he says there were two people, two beggars, okay? Now, are those in conflict? No. If there's two, there's one. See, Mark just happens to drill into the one, okay? You see that? And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. That's what religion will do. Shh, shh, stop, stop. Don't bother God with that, right? But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still. He's walking. He hears, have mercy on me. And called him Son of David, recognizing his royal lineage. It stopped Jesus in his tracks. You can stop Jesus in his tracks by calling out for mercy. He's going to listen to whatever the request is. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise. He's calling for you. The same people that were going, shish, 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 right? Or now, be of good cheer, he's calling for you. This is the mentality of a lot of religion. Today's your lucky day. The divine lotto has fallen in your favor. No, God is the same to everybody. You don't just get lucky in God. Are you hearing me? Thank you, Jesus. I hope you see it for what it is. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Now that garment, this is what Mark brings out. Mark's got his name, right? They they both said the same thing. Matthew's account, they, they were crying out, Son of David, have mercy. This one points out his name, Bartimaeus, okay, the son of Timaeus. And so he throws off that garment. Now, according to Jewish tradition, you had to have a beggar's garment in order to beg. It's kind of his license to beg. So he throws that off, which is, there's no detail in here without significance. This means he's expecting to not have to beg anymore. There's an anticipation. This is a demonstration of faith. I don't need that anymore. I'm burning my license to beg. I don't have to beg anymore. Are you seeing it? Mm. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Interesting question. See, we just assume that he would want his eyesight, but maybe all he wanted was, you got 50 cents, right? You got any spare change, Jesus? Jesus didn't assume what he wanted, right? The blind man said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Sorry. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Did you notice he didn't say, my power has healed you today? What was the determining factor? His faith. Was it Jesus' faith? Jesus didn't assume anything. He cried out for mercy, stopped him in his tracks, bring him to me. What do you want? A blank check from Jesus. What do you want? Hmm. I hope you get this. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Isn't that potent? There's so much to this story. What was the demonstration of faith? Well, you could say all of it, but throw in that garment off was a big, big, big part of that. It was easy to see what he was believing for, okay? Praise God. Now, you guys go over to Luke chapter 10. Yeah, that... Uh, oops, sorry, I blocked you there. Um, you know, we have to realize, too, I don't know if anybody else thinks this way. I do, and it's. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just being transparent, that there's this idea that we read stories like this and we go, 
Well, yeah, he didn't know any better, so of course he deserves mercy, right? Or maybe he wasn't born again. You guys ever hear that one? They sort of like discount that this stuff is available to us because these people weren't born again, so it was mercy. No, like Romans 8 says, actually, no, excuse me, Romans 8 and Romans chapter 5 both kind of say the same thing, that when we were his enemy, Christ died for us. How much more now? The fact that we are now born again in one spirit with him, there's more willingness from God to work on our behalf. So we should read these stories and say, my cry out for mercy should have a greater effect because I'm his son. Is that true? Like, now, these guys were uh, sons in that they were Israelites, but I am flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. I'm one spirit with him. So my call for mercy has more weight. And that's scripture. How much more now that I'm in him will he not also freely give me all things? He, he, was, he said yes before I said yes to him. Now that I've said yes to him, all things are yes and amen. So, yeah, you can have it and also so be it. Have it. It's yours. You know, and I love in Romans 8, 2, where it talks about how the Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmities. You know, we've talked about that word a lot over the years, but it's this huge Greek compound word, soon ante lombano mei, which say that 10 times fast. <laughs> but, you know, it literally means he wants to help us. He's upset that we're in the middle of something, and he wants us to partner with us to take it away. That's God's attitude. It's so much of a yes. And so the way I approach these kind of scriptures is, Lord, I could sit here and focus on all the places where I've fallen short and shouldn't receive this. But I know you're good, and I know you're full of mercy. Can I just receive that? I just know his attitude is, okay. You know, I, the, yesterday, my oldest daughter, um, she's not in here. She, okay, good. <laughs> They're kids, so I'm not saying she it w- is terrible or anything. She's a wonderful girl. But, you know, she made a mistake, and I watched it happen. And I saw in a microcosm, in just a little way, how God feels about us in this concept that, or this topic of mercy she was ugly to her little brother, right? While I was telling her to stop. Anybody ever have that check in here and you just go, pew, right past it? <laughs> just me? Okay. I've done it. And you know what? I watched her do it. And the initial reaction is justice, <laughs> right? She needs justice. But she immediately fell down crying, Daddy, please forgive me. Oh, and you know what I did? It works. It works. Right? How can I, as a father, representing God to her, have any other response to that? Man, when there's a call for mercy from my children, and I'm, that's why I said I don't want them in here because I don't want them to hear this, really. <laughs> they get it every time because that's how God is with us. Right? And we, I have to represent the Father to them so that the transition from knowing me to knowing God, I want to close that gap. Amen? But the main point here is he is so willing to show mercy. The real question is, are we bold enough to ask for it and humble enough to receive it? That's where the struggle is, I think. Amen. Amen. And I forgot to mention to you that the reason we were going to read the account of Bartimaeus through Matthew's eyes is because it specifically uses the, the term moved with compassion. The fact that he afforded him that power was an act of compassion. He felt what was happening. They, he cried out for mercy. The two cried out for mercy, and, and compassion manifested. Okay, And what you were just talking about, you know, we have an advantage in this dispensation. See, what was happening before the cross, before the day of Pentecost, 
was external. God doing things externally. Now we're transformed internally. We get to partner with him. We feel what he feels. Amen. Now you're there in Luke 10. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. You guys know it? Four of you have heard of it. All right, that's good. All right. And verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Notice it's a lawyer. A lawyer. Don't lose sight of who this is. This is a lawyer. These guys are paid to walk people into traps, you might say, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He, Jesus, said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? I love that Jesus flips the tables. He doesn't answer his question. He asks him a question. Are are you looking at it? So he answered, the lawyer answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. (laughs) I'm sure he's thinking, I know this answer, right? Jesus said, Well, go do it. And then, then he's got to justify himself. Look at this. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Th- that is a lawyer move right there, right? Let's take this a little farther. Look at Jesus' response. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, this is a parable. And there is so much allegory in this. First of all, Jerusalem is a higher elevation. He went down to Jericho. So Jerusalem is a type of heaven, and Jericho is a type of the world or the earth. Okay? Then it says, stripped him. What happened in the garden? We were naked. Who told you you were naked? They were naked the whole time right? Their awareness of being uncovered was awakened. Are you seeing that? Jesus is sharp. Then it says, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Is it possible to be half dead? Is that possible? You're either dead or you're alive. You might be close to death, really close to death, right? But If there's any brain activity or if the heart's still, there's still life, right? So you're dead or you're alive. Half dead. What happened? He died spiritually. He's alive physically, but his spirit died. You see that? That's what happened. uh, God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. That day. Okay, do you see who we're talking about? The person here is Adam, okay? Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is religion, okay? This is representative of religion. So here comes religion, sees him and goes the other way, goes to the other side of the street and passes by completely. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side, meaning that he was seen. This guy that was half dead was seen by the law. Levite represents the law, the Levitical law, right? Passes by on the other side. Religion can't help you, and the law cannot help you. Good place to shout, right? But a certain Samaritan, remember, Jews did not like the Samaritans. He's messing with them. I'm telling you he's messing with them, right? Remember the Samaritan woman? We we talked about this in this series. Was tapped, first of all, a woman. Secondly, Samaritan woman was used of Jesus to be the first witness that he's the Christ. (laughs) Man, this is huge. So basically saying... He came in a way that you didn't expect, okay? That's what we're going to celebrate next week, right? 
as he journeyed, came where he was. That's what Jesus did. He came where we are. He meets us where we are. Even in this life now, even after being born again, when we struggle, Jesus meets us where we are. And he's moved with compassion. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. There it is. This is one of the 12 times. Okay? So he went to him. He didn't go on the other side of the street. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Hmm. Oil and wine. What is that a type of? The Holy Spirit, right? New wine, the oil, right? Okay. And set him on his own animal. We are joint heirs with Christ, are we not? We, we are, all his property is our property. Amen? Brought him to an inn. Now, this word inn is different from the one we'll see next week. This word is public lodging, okay? Um. This inn is a type of the church, okay? So he takes him to the inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the inn keeper, that would be the Holy Spirit, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Notice the Samaritan's going to return. About how long? A denarii is one day's wage. He gave him two. Denary. About two days later, a day is with the Lord, is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. We're about in that zone right there where Jesus is going to return. He will come back. Amen? Are you seeing all this? Isn't this powerful? Uh, verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy. The demonstration of compassion, right? Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Here's this guy trying to justify himself. Like, okay, who's, who's my neighbor, right? Who, who was Jesus in that parable? The Samaritan. The one that came in a way you didn't expect. He was not from the, the tribe of Levi. He didn't come through the Levitical priesthood. He didn't come that way. He was the tribe of Judah, the lineage of David. He came a completely different way. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. And that's why a lot of the Jews missed it. Amen? Now, in closing, go over to Hebrews chapter 4. Yeah, I want to go back to this, um, the question that this guy asked, and who is my neighbor, right? Um, I'm not... How do I say this? I'm not saying that anybody who's ever asked this question has the heart that I'm about to describe. But I'm saying we can fall in, any one of us can fall into the trap of having this heart. Um, asking the God this question, Lord, who should I minister to today? Why ask that question? Who did you pass? Right? And I want to show you that there's scriptural precedent for that. And, and here's, why, here's why I don't like that question. Now, are there people who you're very aware are probably not available for that? Yeah, but I think that's the minority, right? Um, but the idea is that God's going to say, well, there's 50 people in a room. I really only want that one. What? I don't, uh, give me Bible for that. I'll, I'll die on that hill. But listen to this. This is Jesus' heart on this. In Matthew 5, in verse 43, and there's, there's two other sections. I believe it's Philippians chapter 2, and then Romans 12, starting in about verse 14, I think. And it feels the same as what I'm about to read. It's, they're beautiful pieces of Scripture. Also Colossians three in there, so four places. But anyway, it says, um, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So this kind of feels like the same thing, where it's like you're only supposed to be good to certain people, right? Uh, but I say to you, love your enemies. 
Well, that becomes way more inclusive. That includes everyone. (laughs) Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, I'm going to skip down um, my poor little girl. She's having a moment. Anybody ever have a moment? Um, Listen to this. In verse 45, uh, for he, God, makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Can you imagine if God, which that would help narrow it down a little bit, if maybe that person who's not walking right just had a ring where it wasn't raining on them? That'd be awkward for them. That's not the case. God is blanket good to everyone. And he's saying, be like that. Don't discriminate on who you're good to. And Jesus said the same thing in this verse here. This guy's like, well, who should I be good to? As if that's a select group. No. Be good to the person who, in your mind, doesn't deserve it, and it didn't happen the way you thought it should happen. Amen? Now, this is easy to say. It's hard to do. It's very hard to do, especially when somebody has wronged you. It's very hard to do. But that's when this compassion makes it possible. And it's the only way it should happen. Because anybody ever do this? You be good to somebody to spite them. That's not God. Right? We see this scripture in Romans 12 where it says, when it talks about doing good to people, you'll throw coals on their head. That's not the purpose. That's the outcome. We don't use the goodness of God as a weapon. Right? He's just saying there, some people are going to react that way. They're going to get angry because they're going to be convicted. But that's none of our business. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He convicts the world of sin and of righteousness. Our job is to do good. Amen? Amen. Amen. When he was talking about people walking around with a place where it wasn't raining, I'm thinking the opposite, like the Truman Show, where it's just, just raining on them only. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's good. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 14. Let me say before that, before I say that, that if we're going to have mercy or be good to somebody who's not good to us, somebody who has positioned themselves as an enemy, you need this compassion. You need his compassion. Otherwise, you're just doing a, a religious task. He, he gives you the compassion to make it possible. Amen. Hebrews 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need was reading that this week because Jesus is able to relate to us in our struggles. Exactly the way we struggle, he knows that struggle. He was in all points tempted, all points in principle. Amen? And when we we talked about it earlier, we see grace, mercy, compassion, all these, this little family of words, and we try to delineate them. They, They really do work together. We obtain mercy. We cry out like Bartimaeus did. We ask for mercy and we find grace. Grace is uncovered when we ask for mercy. And I want to submit something to you. As I read that this week, the compassion we're talking about is grace. It's an absolute grace of God, to let your heart have the emotions of sympathy for somebody else who may, in fact, be doing you wrong. That's the place to get to. Now, mercy gifts, we talk about redemptive gifts, people like Miriam Miriam and Anita, this is much, much easier for them. But we can all do that. We we all want to be moved with compassion. In other words, this 
this churning deep in our heart. It's the emotions of God. Have you ever had that happen uh, and there's no reason for it? You know what I mean? Where all of a sudden you have a compassion and a pity. Maybe it's an absolute stranger, somebody you've never even seen before. You have no idea what their story is, but somehow this churning starts on the inside. You need to follow that. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians 14 says, desire spiritual gifts, but follow love. Follow after love. When that stuff starts happening, there's an anointing manifesting. Drill into that a little bit. Maybe you need to, to introduce yourself and just say, can I pray for you? you? You'd be amazed what happens. I don't know many people reject prayer. It happens, but, but it's not often. Amen. What did Sure. Just one quick point. I just want to say this too, that... So, you guys, who here is familiar with the Redemptive Gifts series? Oh, not nearly enough. Okay. So, regarding mercy, my wife is a mercy. I am a prophet redemptive. She's hitting the wall on the mercy scale, and I'm flying out the door on the other side, <laughs> okay? But here's the thing, because this, this sometimes I've heard this as a response well, I'm just not wired that way. Well, neither am I. However, the Lord gave me this years ago. The place in me that wants justice that can turn into revenge says in James, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy, God's mercy through me will satisfy the place in me that wants justice. Amen? So you don't have to be wired for this. Mercy works across the board. Amen? Praise God. Well, I hope you got something out of that. Let's seal the deal with communion. So, John.